it's very, very difficult when you have a loved one who's in the grips of this yeah. disease. Oh, yeah. And it's a sense of powerlessness that is unlike anything mm -hmm. else. You cannot will that person mm -hmm. to make a change. There's nothing about it that's rational or logical. Alcoholics, if you present them with this idea, look, you can keep drinking, jails, institutions, or death. That's mm -hmm. the only place this is going. Or you can get sober and just your life will change and you'll be met with unlimited possibilities. Mm -hmm. And the alcoholic will say, I need to think about it. Right. Like, you know, and, and normal people don't understand that. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Rich Roll, who is uh, an ultra endurance athlete, best selling author, and host of the Rich Roll podcast. Um, began his athletic career in his 40s mm. and uh, was, uh, was an alcoholic, 50 pounds overweight, and within two years, at the age of 43, if I'm not mistaken, you won the stage one of the ultra marathon, which is a three day, 320 mile triathlon. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and you're also one of men's health top uh, 25 fittest men in the entire world, which is impressive. Um, but I would like to, one thing I always do with all of my audiences, dive into your story and kind of how you got to where you are, because it hasn't mm -hmm. always been uh, rainbows and unicorns mm -hmm. uh, to get you to where you are. Uh, but if you would uh, kind of start off on, you know, how you got to where you are, I would uh, love for everyone to know. How far back you do you want to go? <laughs> uh, we can go back to, you know, college time and yeah. uh, the transition of everything that happened to you. Well, you mentioned that that uh, I started my athletic career in my 40s. It's it's not technically accurate because I was a swimmer growing up. Mm -hmm. Swam uh, at a very high level competitively throughout high school and um, and collegiately at Stanford, which had the number one swimming program in the country mm -hmm. at the time in the late 1980s. So I competed on two NC2A Division One championship teams. Uh, sharing lanes with Olympic gold medalists and world record holders and American record holders. So I do have a robust athletic background. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I got to college, well, prior to college leading up to that, I was a very studious, introverted uh, kind of kid. You know, I never got into trouble. I didn't party. I was just, a, I was on the grind all the time. I got up at 4.45 every morning, went to the pool, swam an hour and a half, went to school, uh, back to the pool after school, two more hours in the pool, wow. homework, 9 p.m., lights out, repeat, and did that from age 14 through high school. So by the time I was a senior in high school, I was, you know, regarded as one of, a, you know, one of the, the top recruits in the country and started going on all these recruiting trips and, you know, had gotten my grades to the relatively close to the top of my class. Um, so the world was very much my oyster. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that I was going to go to Harvard. I told them that I was, I got in and was intending to go there. I told the swim coach, this is where I'm going. Visited Stanford at the last minute because I had always, like as a kid growing up in Washington, D.C., who had a stack of Swimming World magazines pre-internet on my bedstand, would see, uh, you know, these, these heroes of mine who were at the farm at Stanford and never thought that I was quite good enough or that I would have a shot to compete at that level because there's a difference between being a standout high school swimmer and being an Olympic contender. Right. That's a pretty wide gap. Um, but I visited at the last minute, fell in love with the people and the campus and uh, the idea of swimming outdoors every day and the combination of being able to train and compete at the highest level in my sport alongside the best people in the world while also attending arguably the best, if not, you know, one of the best, you know, academic institutions in the country. And I just couldn't say no to that. So that's how I ended up at Stanford. Um, and I loved it. And there was an environment there that was very conducive to, um, open-minded thinking in the sense that if you came with a dream, there was an institution there to support it. And nobody said, you gotta pick academics or you gotta pick swimming. You're not gonna be able to excel at both. Instead, it was an environment that said, why not? Mm -hmm. Like, that's what you're here to do. How can we support you? And I love that ethos about that institution that I think still uh, is a hallmark of, 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 of what makes Stanford great. Mm -hmm. um, but when I arrived at college, I you know quickly uh, fell into, uh, uh, the partying scene. I had gotten drunk a couple times and, you know, I could tell that whole story, but essentially what happened was, um, 
alcohol from the first time that I experienced it just gave me a sensation that I knew fundamentally, even at age 18, was different from my peers. Like it was like this warm blanket that, mm. uh, you know, made me feel comfortable and as if all the problems in the world faded away. And I had this sense of feeling like I thought I was supposed to feel all the time. Mm. And it was a facilitator to a social life that had previously eluded me. I could suddenly look a girl in the eye and have a conversation and go to parties and be sociable, which I had never done in my life prior to that. And I loved it. And over time, it was a very slow erosion, but over time that became much more important to me than any of the goals that I had set for myself as this high school senior um, looking at conquering the world. So fast forward, you know, to a very dark place that alcohol took me at age 31 prior to getting sober. But along the way, I had a lot of good times and it did, it did teach me some social skills that I was lacking. So it wasn't all bad. It's, it's, it works until it stops working. And the extent to which it stopped working um, was kind of a progressive thing that occurred over a, uh, over many years mm -hmm. but you know it didn't take long before i was the kid who was the last one to leave the party or was going out three or four nights a week when i was still getting up to go to swim practice and suddenly you know my times aren't so good and my grades are slipping and i didn't care i just was focused on where's the next good time right so i maintained my drinking after college lived in new york city and that was really an accelerant to the whole thing because uh new york city at that time, early 90s, it was like Disneyland for alcoholics. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I had an alcohol problem, but I was very far away from uh, being in a place where I was ready to reckon with it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give you my background. So my father was an alcoholic. Parents got divorced when I was mm -hmm. nine because of it. And then he passed away when I was 15 from alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So sorry to hear I've, that. Oh, thank you. So I've I've been thinking about it my entire life and just kind of what what gets somebody to that point? And what's interesting is that, you know, uh, are you familiar with Gabor Mate? Yeah. So I know I know him fairly well. Yeah. So he talks a lot about almost all addiction in some sort of way is is trauma based. And there's there's sometimes when it's when it's not, it just happens to be like you said, where it's maybe for the feeling that it gave you and the fact that it was able to get you outside of your shell and give you a you know an experience that you weren't able to have. Do you feel like there was something that was trauma based or do you feel like you just went Hey, I'm, I'm too far down the line at this point. And I've, I, it gave me something that I wanted to like social skills or getting me out of my shell. And then just one day you're like, I'm too far down. Well, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think there's a lot of merit in Gabor's work mm -hmm. and what he has to say. I think it's mostly instructive in terms of, uh, a parent looking at how to guide a young person to right. avoid right. the kind of trauma that might trigger something like that. As somebody who's been in recovery for well over 20 years at this point, um, I can tell you that the solution lies less in looking in the rear view mirror and mm -hmm. more about the practical tools that you can access and apply in order to, you know, rectify some of your preset behavior patterns mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of the mental narratives that's been in your head to live a better life. In my case, I didn't have alcoholic parents. There was no alcoholism around me. I never really saw people drink excessively. And I don't think anybody gets out of childhood without some kind of trauma. Sure. Yeah. Um, and different people index the level of impact that those kinds of traumas may have. Mm -hmm. But I didn't suffer any kind of trauma where I can point to it and say, this is why. Um, and I think it's important to understand that, like I said earlier, you can go down that rabbit hole and spend years trying to parse how you got to this For place sure. where you became an alcoholic, but ultimately um, it's not that helpful, yeah. you know, in terms of like how to live now. Right. Yeah. Hey, these days it'd be hard to find time to sit down and learn. And it's not easy with the likes of social media. They could be so addictive and so time consuming. So you might think to yourself, when do I have time to develop myself? But there's an app that I've been using for five years now that I highly recommend. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is for anyone who cares about learning, but doesn't have a whole lot of time on their hands. And Blinkist takes all of the key insights and ideas from over 4,000 nonfiction bestsellers in more than 27 
categories and turns them into 15 minute text and audio explainers that they call Blinks with all of the key ideas from each book. And over 15 million people are already using Blinkist to broaden their knowledge in 27 nonfiction categories, including self-help, personal growth, management, leadership, mindfulness, happiness, and more. And I love Blinkist because it's short, it's to the point, exactly like me, and you can get all of your reading done in just a few minutes. Or you can actually listen to it as well. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer for just my audience. If you go to Blinkist.com slash mindset, you will get a seven-day free trial and 25% off of Blinkist Premium Membership. That is Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash mindset for 25% off and a seven day free trial, Blinkist.com slash mindset. Hey, let me tell you about my favorite drink that I take every single morning, first thing in the morning when I wake up. It's called Athletic Greens. I wake up, I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I drink Athletic Greens, and then I get my day started. And in 30 seconds, in just one scoop, I get 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients, and it has everything that a multivitamin has, plus greens, probiotics, prebiotics, digestive enzymes, immunity formula, adaptogens, and so much more. And with all that's happening right now, I just wanna make sure my immunity is as best that it possibly can be, which is why I take it every single morning. So if you're looking to upgrade your multivitamin or just take one nutritional formula that's going to help you cover all of your bases, then you want to try Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens makes getting a high quality nutrition as easy as possible without the need to buy multiple products. So make an investment in your health today and try the ultimate all-in-one wellness bundle and support your immunity, gut health, energy, and so much more by visiting athleticgreens.com slash dial. You'll receive a full year supply of liquid vitamin D for free. With your first purchase, just go to athleticgreens.com slash dial. Yeah, I always tell people it's, 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 if you look back at the why too much, it's going to get in the place of the what and the how, like, what do I need to do? How do I need to get through it? And I feel like sometimes people do go too far in the past and pay too much attention to it. When in reality, you're in this present moment and there's something that might be in front of you that, that you can work on. Yeah. And, um, so this was, this was, you know, if you, if you talk about, you said when you were 31, so about 13 years that you were, you were, a uh, an alcoholic and performing well. And I mean, you graduated, you became a, a lawyer and everything. Yeah. I mean, I was fairly high functioning for mm -hmm. a long time. I got right. through law school. I don't know how I did that. Yeah. Like I, you know, uh, and I lived in New York city and then I worked in a law firm, but you know, like I said, my life was degrading, you know, day to day and the kind of circumstances that I would find myself in were becoming progressively more and more dire. Mm. Um, I was able to get away with it for a long time, but as any alcoholic will tell you, they think that no one knows what they're actually doing, right. but it's pretty transparent. Um, and it was, it was, it was bad. I mean, at the very end, I was the guy who would pour a vodka tonic before I would get in the shower in the morning and I'd put a tall boy between my legs to drive drunk to work and wow. I would sneak drinks throughout the day just waiting until I could get home and like get my buzz on, you know, real time and then go out and inevitably black out. There's so many, you know, I have tons of crazy stories, but ultimately there was nothing very Bukowski or rock and roll or sexy about it. It was just sad, lonely, and pathetic. And it really came to a head not that long after I moved down to Los Angeles where I got two DUIs in a row, like mm. literally within a period of six weeks of each other, I was facing jail time. I had rear-ended um, an elderly woman. I was, you know, I, and my license had been stripped. My boss knew about it. My, the whole house of cards was basically collapsing on, yeah. on top of me. And, uh, and it's not that I didn't know that I was an alcoholic. I knew I was, I knew I was an alcoholic for a long time, but there's a powerlessness that's baked into this disease. Mm. You know, it's essentially this allergy of the body, but it's really uh, a spiritual disease. And people, um, when you hear about, you know, that, that bottom that people hit, that's mm -hmm. different for every people. And I think it's calibrated in accordance with people's pain threshold. Mm -hmm. You know, the elevator is going down. Sometimes it's going down slow. It went, it went down slow for me for a long time. Then it started to accelerate. And at any moment, you have the opportunity to step off and change your life. But it had to go down pretty far for me before I was willing to really reckon with it. And, you know, it was a situation in which my life was clearly going nowhere fast. And my family didn't want anything to do with me anymore. I'd lost a bunch of friends. I was quickly on route to becoming unemployed, mm -hmm. sleeping on a bare mattress in a shitty apartment with no furniture and just alone, you know, and 
that was really the catalyst. And I ended up going to a rehab facility in Oregon where I thought in my mind, I was gonna spin dry for 28 days like mm -hmm. people do. And when I got there, you know, I realized that my best thinking, me thinking I'm this smart guy, I got into Harvard, I went to Stanford, I went to Cornell Law School, I have all these skills and I was this swimmer. I don't belong in a place like this, but my best thinking had essentially landed me in, you know, to put it bluntly, a mental institution. Yeah. And that landed like a, you know, like a pile of bricks on top of me. And I just remember thinking, I need to do this right because I never want to come back here again. And ultimately that led me to being open and honest about how I was actually living for the very first time because alcoholics are, are loners, you know, they isolate, they don't want to tell anyone what they really feel and they feel like their problems are totally unique and nobody would understand them. And when I finally, you know, opened up and started saying, this is, this is what I do, this is what a day in the life looks like for me, the counselors essentially said, well, one counselor in, in particular said, listen, you have, you have a case of alcoholism that we typically only see in like 65 year old lifelong drinkers. Like it's bad. Hmm. And if you don't sort this out for yourself, like you will die. I've seen it a million times. You can leave whenever you want, but we would suggest that you stick around. And I said, whatever you need me to do, I'm here. And I ended up living in that treatment facility for a hundred days. Hmm. Was there like a, a one moment where it was like, you said that you knew for a while, but there's one moment where you're like, I have to make a change. And it was like, that was the moment where you decided to, to wake up or was it just the slow burn like you're talking about? I mean, it was a slow burn, but Rob, I think you would agree that, that all of us at moments in our life, like it's sort of like uh, um, sliding doors. Like there are these windows of opportunity that suddenly appear where your willingness to make that change matches up with a set of circumstances that allow you to kind of step through that door and make that change. Because like I said, I knew this was gonna end badly. I knew at some point I was either gonna kill somebody, kill myself, end up in jail or get sober. But I just couldn't get myself to make any of those changes until one day I just was ready. And I can't explain it any more further than that, yeah. but to say that you know the level of pain that I was in, like the the, the, the pain that I was experiencing um, exceeded the fear of the unknown because it's a very scary prospect. And you probably know this from your father, the, the, the idea of getting sober. It's like only alcoholics, if you present them with this idea, look, you can keep drinking, jails, institutions, or death. That's mm -hmm. the only place this is going. Or you can get sober and just your life will change and you'll be met with unlimited possibilities. Mm -hmm. You'll be happy. You'll be a uh, responsible member of society again. And the alcoholic will say, I need to think about it. Right. Like, you know, and, and normal people don't understand that. And I'm sure growing up that caused a lot of chaos and confusion and mm -hmm. pain, you know, and turmoil and trauma for yourself and your family. Sure. Yeah. And I, I get messages from people all the time, which is why I, I you know, I don't want to dive too deep into it, but I think I, I appreciate you sharing because there's a lot of people that hear my story and they're like, well, my father's going through this, my mother's going through this, or they're going through it as well. And it's, it's important, I think, for people to hear this and also to realize that there's nothing wrong with those people. Like they think there's something wrong with them. And I'm like, it's, they, they kind of just need support sometimes. And it's also sounds like from what you said, it's, it's just some people get to a point where they realize they need yeah. the help. It's, it's very, very difficult when you have a loved one who's in the grips of this yeah. disease. Oh, yeah. And it's a sense of powerlessness that is unlike anything mm -hmm. else. You cannot will that person mm -hmm. to make a change. There's nothing about it that's rational or logical. Did you go to Al-Anon when you did, were a kid? Yeah. yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I went to Al-Anon more than my dad went to AA. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, it's, there are people who have messed me that have been Al-Anon and it's mm -hmm. it, as, as a, a child of an alcoholic, it's super hard to understand because also you feel like, and I never consciously knew this until I did a lot of work on myself of, oh, most of my trauma comes because I actually thought my dad loved alcohol more than he loved me. Mm -hmm. Right. But then you grow up and you're like, that's not actually the case. But now that is some of the trauma that I need to work through, mm -hmm. you know, because you see this thing and you're like, I just want him to be around. I want him to show, I want, I want to, I say I got, I got lucky in the sense that um, my father was an alcoholic who he never hit me. He never abused me. He never emotionally, physically, sexually abused me. Any of that stuff, he got drunk and he fell asleep. 
But in turn, there's emotional neglect that comes from that, right? Mm-hmm. Times you're supposed to pick me up, didn't pick me up, um, having to walk home by myself, you know, thinking he was going to pick me up to go fishing, sitting on the steps. It's, it's the, the typical well, just the story day in, here. day out trauma of not having a dad present right. in your life and, you know, falling into that belief that he must love that more than he loves me. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been some work. It's been a, mm-hmm. a lot of years. I mean, I, I, I look at it this way. It was a blessing. It was the, the day he died was the worst day of my life, but it was also the best day of my life because it made me realize this is going to end. And I don't think that I would do any of the stuff that I do now. Mm-hmm. I, I actually, I, not that I think, I would not do the things that I do now. I wouldn't have the podcast. I wouldn't, you know, try to help people with it. So in turn, I think it's turned into a beautiful thing. It's the way that it always works. Yeah, it's, it's supposed the to work this things, way, right? If you give them the attention and wrestle with your demons and do the inside work, mm-hmm. those terrible moments generally are the generators of yeah. amazing lives. For sure. Hey, things are heating up and summer's almost here. But with Huzzah, you're covered with the perfect summer drink. Huzzah is a probiotic seltzer with many benefits. And everything's more fun when you feel your best. That's why Huzzah adds probiotics to their seltzer to help support your healthy gut. It's tasty and exhilarating when chilled, and it's non-perishable, so you can store at room temperature. And you can experience the bold flavors that pair perfectly at a picnic or a backyard hang, all with three grams of sugar or less per 12-ounce can to help you feel your best before diving into the summer. They have three different flavors, raspberry, lemon which is tangy fruitiness with a citrus spark and zero sugar and five calories they have juicy pear which is crisp bursting with flavor only three grams of sugar and 15 calories and then my favorite is strawberry hibiscus it's ripe strawberries with a tropical backdrop just three grams of sugar and 15 calories so get your cooler ready and stock up on huzzah probiotic seltzer by using the code dial for 20 percent off your order at drink huzzah.com so once again just use the code dial for 20 percent off at drink H-U-Z-Z-A-H dot com. Hey, life is fragile. And the older that I get, the more I realize I got to make sure that my family is safe just in case something happens to me. And that's why it makes sense why people get life insurance, especially term coverage, which is surprisingly affordable. Why not pay a little bit each month to protect the ones that you love? If you're asking yourself the same question, choose Ladder. Ladder makes it impressively fast and easy to get covered. You just need a few minutes and a phone or laptop to apply to Ladder's smart algorithms as they work in real time so you can instantly find out if you're approved. There's no hidden fees and you can cancel at any time. And since life insurance costs more as you age, now is the time to make sure you cross it off your list. So check out Ladder today to see if you're instantly approved. Go to ladderlife.com slash dial. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash dial ladderlife.com slash dial. So you go there for a hundred days. Um, and then it again, wasn't all rainbows and sunshine after that. Right. So, um, after you get out of there, you were still, you you went back and worked, I think as as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then there was a moment where you, you just decided that you wanted to to do what you do now. It seemed. Yeah, it was, uh, excuse me. (laughs) I'm sorry. Was your, Um, were you with your wife at this point in time? No. Well, I met my wife. So I come out of treatment and my, my whole MO was to build the most solid foundation of sobriety that I possibly could. I was so terrified of relapsing or being back in that place, mm-hmm. that desperate, lonely place that I was in. So when I came back to Los Angeles, it was just all about meetings. Like I just went to two meetings a day. I needed to change all my friends mm-hmm. and found some, I mean, the, the good thing about, one of the many good things about LA is there's incredible recovery here. And there's a lot of amazing young people in recovery and the community is just unbelievably supportive. So I embrace that wholeheartedly and that was the most important thing in my life. So yes, I went back to the law firm where I was working, uh, but prior to leaving the treatment center, the counsel, the count, my main counselor was like, listen, I really think that you should be celibate and avoid dating or getting involved in a relationship for at least the first year because so many of my issues were tied up in how i interrelated with the opposite sex because Mm -hmm. that's how i learned to talk to girls i couldn't do it sober and the idea of trying to do that was terrifying to me and i needed to really just focus on developing life skills and getting as sober as i possibly could before i could welcome in any other human being because i'd never been in a healthy relationship before. So I did that. But right when I (laughs) reached the one year mark, I met my wife and and that was, that was it. Like she's literally the only person that I've dated in a significant, in a significant way in sobriety. And we've now been together for 
21 years. Yeah. And it seems like from the stories, the research I've done, it seems like she's pretty amazing as well. She's a badass. Yeah. Like when you talk about the stories, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you talk about the stories of like, you know, you were, you were at a point one time where you couldn't even, uh, pay for your garbage to be picked up. So they took your mm -hmm. trash cans. Right. And, uh, but she still was supportive in, in getting you and helping you to where you wanted to be. It wasn't so much helping me. It was more helping us mm -hmm. the, the idea behind it. So Yes, I went back to the law firm and there's a whole story about that, but mm -hmm. ultimately I ended up walking away from that life when I start to discover that there's so much more to explore as I wrestled with this kind of existential crisis that I was having about who I was and what I'm here to do. And that was a multiple, that was multiple years of trying to figure things out during which time we went through a very difficult financial time um, where the prospect of just putting food on the table mm -hmm. became precarious. Mm -hmm. And part of that was, yes, there was, there, was a, there was a time where we couldn't pay to have our garbage bins, uh, couldn't pay to have our garbage picked up. So they took the bins away and we would have to put the garbage in the back of this beat up, uh, our only car, which was a beat up minivan with like 250,000 miles on it, find a dumpster somewhere to dump mm -hmm. it. And it was humiliating and emasculating as a guy who, you know, again, going back to like, I'm this person with this pedigree and I should be doing this. Mm. And now I have kids and I'm married and, and it's a tough pill to swallow. So you're wrestling with this idea of, of, of chasing meaning, you know, they call it following your passion. I don't, I'm not a big fan of that mm -hmm. phraseology, but finding meaning, trying to connect with something more potent and personally fulfilling to do with my life. And that was not a, a quick process. So during that period of time, yeah, there was a lot of hardships. And Julie, you know, I would have moments where I'm like, screw this, I, I, I need to like, just get a paycheck, doesn't matter what it is. And she would say, no, you're like on this path. And for you to stop or backtrack now is to disrespect everything that we've gone through to date. And I have faith, like she had extreme faith Hmm. that this would play out in a positive way, but that we had to just, if anything, double down on the way that we were kind of pursuing this path. So it was her strength, I think, that in so many ways allowed me to stay in it when my faith faltered. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she's a powerhouse. Like her spiritual practice is, is something to behold and she doesn't suffer fools lightly. And I think when you talk about spirituality, the mind wanders to a bunch of new age people doing mm -hmm. crazy stuff, talking about a bunch of nonsense, but really what it is, is an internal fortitude mm. and a sense of um, fidelity to whatever your North Star may be. Mm. That's beautiful. And so what was the path that you found at that point? Well, what happened was I get out of treatment, I'm working on my sobriety, I meet Julie, we're together. And that there was a decade in which in addition to just being sober, my goal was to become a responsible member of society again, mm -hmm. like to rebuild everything that I had destroyed and to regain a level of respectability, to be a responsible member of society. And in my mind, the path towards doing that was to, you know, double down at work at this law firm and become a partner and do all the things that society will smile upon and mm -hmm. approve of. So that ushered in a phase of of workaholism because the way alcoholism works is you could take the drugs and the alcohol away right that's not really the cure like mm -hmm. the drugs and the alcohol are a symptom of an underlying disorder right. that just wants more that's trying to fill this hole that you have in your soul and your spirit and if you're not fully dialed in in your recovery program your behavior is going to start to manifest in all manner of unhealthy ways. You're either going to get into a terrible relationship or you're going to start gambling or you're going to be shopping too much or you're going to be now scrolling on social media all right. day. In my case, it manifested in workaholism. And this is important because so, people don't talk about workaholism mm -hmm. enough. Like that was how my trauma manifested mm -hmm. from my father was working 110 hours a week. Well, because it's something that you feel like you can control. Right. And for you, coming out of an environment in which there's a lot of chaos, it's not surprising that, that, that you would gravitate mm -hmm. towards that. Like, I'm in my domain, mm -hmm. here's what I do, 
And as long as I'm working and you know pushing these papers around in this particular way, I'm gonna be able to create the life that I want for right. myself. And what happens with that is that it's myopic to the bigger picture uh, around purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. And so while I was chasing all of this, I was also medicating my repressed emotional state through unhealthy food. So I was basically a junk food junkie, mm -hmm. eating all my food through drive-ins and you know late night Chinese food at the law firm or whatever the case may be. So by the time I was 39 coming up on 40, I was about 50 pounds overweight. Um, never like, I was never like a big morbid, morbidly obese guy or anything like that. Just like a heavy guy who looks like he's working in the law firm too much and riding the elevator up and down was mm -hmm. the extent of my physical exertion <laughs> right. for the day. Um, and in my mind, this is fine. Like I'm, but I'm also in the back of my, you know, in the, in the, in my heart of hearts, in the back of my mind, I'm like. I'm really unhappy here. I look around at these partners. I don't aspire to any of their lives. You make partner, then you just get more responsibility. And I saw a lot of relatively unhappy people who then become leveraged to the hilt because they would buy the house that's a little bit out of their reach yeah. or lease the car that's just a little bit too expensive. And before you know it, you got kids and you wake up and you're 45 and you're like, well, this is my life. Like mm -hmm. I can't course can't correct out, at this yeah. point, I'm too far in. And I had that sense that if I didn't do something different, that that was gonna be me. And I was terrified about that, but I didn't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. This was the only thing that I'd ever really considered. And it dawned upon me that I'd never, despite this high level education that I had and parents that cared about me and, and always met my needs and the like, I had never spent a minute thinking about what it was that I wanted to do for myself. I didn't feel entitled to that. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that comes with this other thing that that people who are lucky enough to get a great education don't feel like it's okay to talk about, which mm -hmm. is if you, if you get that kind of education, then you need to go be this kind of person in the world. Yeah. And, and you're, you can't really squander it to chase some crazy dream right. because then what was all that for? Right. And I was dealing with a lot of that at the same time. So this existential crisis eventually crashes into a health crisis when, um, I come home late from work. I'm on the precipice of turning 40. My family's asleep and I'm walking up the stairs to go to bed. And I had to pause up a simple flight of stairs. I was winded, out of breath, sweat on my brow, heart disease runs in my family. Hmm. I had tightness in my chest and I thought, am I having a heart attack? Like it was a scary moment in which everything suddenly became crystal clear, like the, another sliding door mm -hmm. situation, line in the sand moment, where I suddenly had a willingness to make some of the changes that I knew that I needed to make with respect to my lifestyle and to really tackle this existential dread that was consuming me at the time. And I think looking back, I mean, you mentioned, you know, you have these bad moments in your life and ultimately they become good things. I knew because of what had happened to me so many years prior, eight, nine years prior, where I made that decision to go to that rehab and how drastically my life had changed as a result of that decision. So mm -hmm. I had the sense that a simple decision can change your life. Mm -hmm. And the idea that anybody can change their life if they can summon the courage to welcome the unknown into their life because that had happened to me before. But that was a very specific moment. I'm gonna to go to this treatment center. You know, Had I waited a day, I don't know if I ever would have gone. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on the staircase, I had this palpable sensation that I was being visited once again with one of those moments. And I knew well enough that it was gonna require me to act right away because if I just let it pass and say, well, that was weird, you know, maybe I should eat a little bit better, or go yeah. to the gym, yeah. that that wasn't gonna work. Like I needed to do something immediate and drastic that was similar, that would that would like connect me with that experience of going to that treatment center in a different way. Um, and that's what I did. So the next day I did like a seven day, I started this seven day fruit and vegetable juice cleanse mm -hmm. because that felt like a version of detoxing off drugs, right. but with food. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I felt like I needed to detox my body. I just needed to do something hard that would like wipe the slate clean yeah. and 
and, and provide me with a new perspective and some momentum, which I think is very important in making any change in your life, to begin this journey of how I was going to recreate how I was living. Yeah. So did you decide at that, after that point, had you, did you become a vegan or did it take time until you, no, that took you time. get there? Yeah, that took time. It's funny because if you Google my name, it, it all looks like all this stuff happened in a very compressed period. Right. Like he was a drunk and he went vegan yeah. and then he was doing ultra marathon. It's like, <laughs> yeah. this is like yeah. we're talking about like a 15 year, well, it was right. like, you know, nine years sober before yeah. the health thing. And then it took about six or eight months of playing around with diets before I entertained the possibility of trying to eat a 100% plant-based mm -hmm. diet. Like I didn't want to, mm -hmm. it wasn't like, oh, I can't wait to not eat animal products. Like I wasn't an animal rights person, but I tried all these other diets. It didn't really seem to work. And that cleanse, that seven day cleanse that I did on the seventh day, I felt incredible. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you've ever done anything like that or done some fasting, yeah. there's something about that process that, that really supercharges your vitality. Mm -hmm. And I just remember like a good alcoholic, I was like, I wanna feel like this all the time, right? You know, <laughs> maybe I'll never eat food again. Yeah. My wife's like, yeah, <laughs> you're still an alcoholic. Like you gotta eat food. I'm like, all right, well, how can I eat so that I feel like that? Yeah. And that's what kind of led me down the rabbit hole of trying a bunch of diets. The last being a plant-based diet because it seemed the most extreme. It seemed the most difficult to master, but nothing else worked. and. Honestly, I was like, I'll try it because I need to check that box and then I'll just go back to eating cheeseburgers because I'm 40 and maybe when you're 40, you're supposed to just feel like shit all the time. <laughs> yeah. So I did it and within a week of making that switch, I did feel like I did on that seventh day. There was something about eating only plants close to their natural state, no mm -hmm. processed foods that really agreed with me mm -hmm. and that was like a profound moment and I've been eating that way ever since. So that was, how long ago was that? I'm 54, so 14 years. So for people listening, they're thinking how, because the way that we understand, you can, people can't see me, it's air quotes, understand nutrition, think if someone's going to be an ultra marathon, they got to get a lot of calories, they got to get a lot of animal products, all of that. So to be a, a vegan ultra marathon runner seems counterintuitive for the average person that's mm -hmm. out there. Do you have uh do you have anything to say around that? Because I think that yeah. for a lot of people that, that switches the way they think. Right. I mean, it's changed a lot um, in the 14 years since I've been doing this. Mm -hmm. Now there's tons of athletes that are yeah. killing it on a plant-based diet and movies like Game Changers have really helped um, uh, change the conversation, the cultural conversation about athletic performance mm -hmm. and a plant-based diet. But at the time, yeah, there weren't that many people doing it. There was one guy that I knew called Rip Esselstyn he was an all-American swimmer at the University of Texas. I competed against him. We didn't really know each other. We weren't friends, but I knew who he was. I knew his name. I'd swum against him when I was a kid. He was a couple years older than me. And we were Facebook friends. And on his Facebook, so this is, what is this, 2006 or something? So just to like yeah. root your internet you know, vernacular around like Facebook being you know, kind of Brand the main new. thing at the time. Um, and he was about to come out with a book called The Engine 2 Diet. And he'd been plant-based for a long time. Then he was a professional, he was a he was an all-American swimmer, and then he was a professional triathlete. He was first out of the water at Kona one year. Like he's a very good athlete. And we started communicating. I was like, tell me about this thing that you're doing, because I just started eating plant-based. I don't know what I'm doing. He's like, oh man, you know, so we started a friendship up and he was kind of mentoring me. Then his book came out, and that was a book, that was a big deal. It was basically he was a fireman at the time. Mm -hmm. And he took all the guys in his firehouse through like a 30 day experience of cooking for them in the firehouse, plant-based only. Yep. And they would do, you know, all the stuff that firemen do, push up challenges and pull up challenges. And he was taking their blood week by week. And there were guys, young guys in there who had crazy cholesterol and all mm -hmm. kinds of like health problems that, you know, somebody in their 30s shouldn't have. Yeah. And he was able to reverse a lot of that. And that provided the basis for this book yeah. that explored the plant-based diet. His father is also um, a, uh, a cardiologist and a, and a researcher who'd done a lot of work in this field and was an Olympic rower and had been eating plant-based for like 50 years. So that was like, those guys really helped me to feel confident or assured that I wasn't being completely irresponsible or crazy. And um, in tandem with that, with this elevated vitality that I was experiencing, I started exercising again, which is something I hadn't done in a long time, despite having been an athlete, but I had no designs on returning to becoming 
competitive in any regard. I just wanted to lose this weight right. that I was carrying. It was really a, a vanity thing. Like I just, I just want to lose weight. I want to look good. I want to be able to enjoy my kids at their energy level. My wife bought me a bike for my birthday and I just, you know, would go out for a jog. I went back to the pool occasionally, but it was all like super casual at mm -hmm. first. It didn't, it, you know, the whole like ultra endurance world didn't come until a fair bit later. Yeah. So what was that transition? Is it just, you just started getting a little bit better, a little bit better, and then something popped up and you're like, all right, I'm going to go run a marathon or a half well, marathon. Yeah. No, what happened was the weight came off really fast and every week I was making crazy gains. Like I would go from being barely able to run, mm -hmm. you know, three or four miles to then running eight miles, like, you know, two weeks later. And I just was feeling good. And I was bouncing back day to day. Like I wasn't getting overtired by any of these workouts. Um, and that started to, you know, get my brain thinking like, wow, I feel like, I can't believe it. You know, I, I was never a runner. Yeah. Um, I can actually go out and run pretty far and pretty fast. And then one day, it's probably about, maybe six months into this whole thing, I went out for a trail run near my house and it was a weekday morning. I didn't have that much time because I had work I had to do. Um, and my plan was just to run for 45 minutes or an hour. But I had that kind of flow state experience mm -hmm. that you hear about. And runners talk about a lot that they're visited with occasionally where you just feel unbelievable, like yeah. you can run forever. And I was experiencing that for the first time. And I just decided to keep running and keep running and keep running and ended up running like 24 miles on that run, which was like so much further than I ever had before. And I just couldn't believe that I was able to do that. And it didn't seem that hard. Like I wasn't that tired afterwards mm -hmm. either. And so that got me thinking about a challenge for the first time. And part of that is also like, hey, you're 40 that's when you start to you know, kind of look at your life and have that midlife crisis. A lot of guys end up going to do Ironmans or buying yeah. a fancy car or something like that. So there was a little bit of that mixed in with this sense that I had that I'd never reached my potential as an athlete because alcoholism had really robbed me of that. Mm. And so that's 24 miles. That's almost an entire marathon just yeah, going for a typical run. Mm -hmm. And then, so how did, how did it transition you going to hundred mile races? What, what was the first really big, oh shit, this is a, this is a big deal for you. Well, so I started entering some triathlons, local little triathlons around town and thought, um, Hey, I'd love to do an Ironman because I'm having a midlife crisis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you didn't, didn't want to get realize, the red Corvette. I didn't know anything about that world at all. Yeah. And I thought you could just sign up for these things. I didn't yeah. realize you got to sign up for them like a year in advance. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was kind of off the table because I didn't want to wait a year in order to have a date on the calendar that would kind of drive me in a certain direction. I did a half Ironman that I didn't finish. I didn't know what I was doing. Like I just cramped up after the bike. It was mm -hmm. a terrible experience. Like I was not off to like this great start of, yeah. you know, where everybody's like, wow, he's, a, he's an amazing endurance athlete. Yeah. Like that was not what was going on. But, but then when I was trying to figure out what would be a cool challenge, I read this article about this race called Ultraman, which I'd never heard of. So for people that are listening that don't know, an Ironman, widely considered the ultimate challenge of endurance, is a one-day race in which you swim 2.4 miles, you ride your bike 112 miles, and then you run a marathon. Super hard. The fastest guys do it in eight hours plus. Most people do it in like 12 to 14 hours or something like that. Um, and I just thought there's nothing harder than that. Like mm -hmm. that's the ultimate challenge. And then here was this Ultraman race that I started reading about, which was twice that distance over three days. It's essentially a double Ironman distance triathlon that circumnavigates the entire big island of Hawaii, a 320 mile race, wherein the first day you swim 6.2 miles, 10 kilometer swim, and then you ride your bike 90 miles with crazy amount of elevation up to Volcano Volcano National Park in, mm. in Hawaii, the Big Island of Hawaii. The second day you race your, so then you go to bed. It's like a stage race. The second day you wake up and you race your bike 171 miles all the way around the island. And then the third day you celebrate this insanity by running 52.4 miles, like a double marathon yeah. to bring you back to where you started. And I'm reading this article and I just, it blew my mind. Like I just didn't think that was humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And the story was really about 
Well, David got it, part of it was about David Goggins because mm -hmm. he had just done this race right so after doing David Goggins had just done it. So he he came so, into that that world before you then. So David, yeah, I mean David's been around for a long time. Like I, I, I mean David was like like the first podcast that he did was my podcast. Yeah. Like in the endurance world, like everybody knew David, mm -hmm. but he wasn't David Goggins. Right. You know, he's not like it's crazy that he's this cultural it's phenomenon huge. now because yeah. he was a, a guy who was doing lots of races in the ultra endurance world which is a very small world mm -hmm. and everybody kind of knew him but he didn't have any visibility outside of that whatsoever mm -hmm. but he had just done the Badwater 135 mar double uh, ultra marathon and then he had done this ultraman race and he had all kinds of problems his pedal broke and he had to tape his shoe to the th it was like his crazy story mm -hmm. and i'd never heard of david prior to this and it was about him being this overweight, powerlifting, football playing Navy SEAL guy who then decided to tackle all of these difficult endurance challenges to raise funds in honor of some of his fallen brothers. Right. At the same time, the description of this race very clearly positioned it as much more of a spiritual journey than a competitive event. Hmm. It is a world championship event. There are athletes there that want to win, but it's... Hands, they hand select just 35 people from all over the world. They keep it really small. And the overarching goal, and there was a quote from the race director, was to provide every athlete and their crews, because it's a self-supported thing, you got to bring people along with you, to have a spiritually transformative experience as a result of not just this difficult endeavor, but really connecting with the island of Hawaii, which is has magical yeah. <laughs> powers in many ways, like it's a very powerful place. And I realized in reading it that that was what I was looking for. I didn't want to do an Iron Man to like check a box or yeah. say that I did this thing. Like I was still very much wrestling with this existential crisis, and I was on some form of a spiritual journey mm -hmm. for sure. of self understanding. And this just seemed like an unbelievable vehicle for that exploration and something inside me clicked and I was like, I am doing this thing. I don't know how or when, but this is what I've been looking for. And I just then proceeded to assume that some way I was gonna find my way into this race because again, you can't just sign up for it. They have to like select you, you have to apply. But I just assumed I was gonna work that out and just proceeded accordingly as if I'd already been admitted. Yeah. And so do you have to do any races before then to then qualify for those? Or is it just like, cause it seems like it's 35 people quite elite where they're going to just be like, yeah, man, you haven't done enough at this point. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that was my dilemma. Now that race has become so popular that there are a lot of things that you have to do in mm -hmm. order to, in order to do it. Um, what I did, and this was a different time was I just called up the race director. Like her name was in the thing and I found her online and I just called her up and I said, I read this article. I, I can't stop thinking about this. Like I literally couldn't sleep. I was like, I have to figure this out. And I just told her, I'm like, I really want to do this. And she said, what have you done? And I basically said, I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Like I was very honest with her. Mm -hmm. I said, please just tell me now that I, it's, you're never going to let me in so I can at least go to sleep and like forget about this. And, and she said something amazing to me, which was, I'm not saying, she didn't say yes and she didn't say no. She said, why don't you call me in a couple months? Because this was very early. It was very far out from like the deadline or all of that. And that was all that I needed. Like she just gave me that little glimmer of hope. I ended up hiring a coach. I told him, this is what I'm doing. He was like, you're crazy, but okay. Mm -hmm. I'll try to prepare you as best as I can. And he put me on, you know, an incredibly rigorous training program that ramped up very slowly. Um, but ultimately was extremely challenging. And I stayed in communication with that race director. I had my coach write a letter saying, I'm going to get him as prepared as I possibly can. And she let me in. And, you know, had she not, like my life would have been very different, I hmm. think. Yeah, this is the thing I was really interested about with you, because I've always thought that these types of things are spiritual journeys. It's, I mean, I guess there are probably some people that go there just competitiveness, but I would think that probably a lot of them, it is a journey, like an inward journey to do something mm -hmm. like this. So for you going and signing up and actually getting into this race, what was the spiritual journey like for you going in? We said it's 320 miles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a journey that played out through the, through the course of, of preparing for it mm -hmm. because as any ultra endurance athlete will tell you, you're spending an unbelievable amount yeah. of time with yourself in an elevated 
heart rate situation mm -hmm. where you're connecting with your breath. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't characterize it as meditation, but it is a form of active mindfulness right. uh, that that I think gave me the space to really go inward. Like mm -hmm. if I was on an eight hour bike ride, like you can't listen to music. The whole, yeah. You know, it's like yeah. I was going deep inside myself and trying to understand what makes me tick, what it is that I want to do, and all I knew was that this was making me happy, and I felt directed. Mm -hmm. And after that 24 mile trail run, I made a decision and a promise to myself that I would that I would no longer ignore the things that brought me joy in my life. And it was this understanding that that those things weren't having a certain kind of house or a certain kind of car or a job. It was the feeling of the sun on my shoulders at dawn on a trail run or what it feels like to jump into a swimming pool. Like these are things that made me so happy as a kid swimming. And I just completely put them in the rear view mirror and said, mm -hmm. I'm an adult now. So I just said, this is, I, I enjoy doing this and I'm going to prioritize making time to continue to do this, even though it doesn't make sense. There's no logical path forward for me. It's not like I'm gonna become a professional athlete right. or figure out a way to make money doing this, but I didn't care. It just felt, I can't, the only way I can explain it is that it just felt like the right thing to do mm. for me. Yeah. Um, you're familiar with Charlie Ingle, I'm sure, right? Yeah, I know Charlie well. So uh, I, I met him at an event and we speak pretty often and he, is uh, he he told me kind of the same thing as well. I mean, he did I think five thousand miles across the Sahara Crazy Desert, yeah. and uh, and it's it's, it's a complete beast. inward journey, you know. Like mm -hmm. it's and and that's the. But what's what's interesting about what you said, is that you didn't want to not do anything that didn't make you happy anymore, which I think that a lot of people get away from. You know, there's a lot of people that email in and they're, message me on Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is, and they're like, you know, I just I don't know what makes me happy anymore. And like you're saying, usually goes back to childhood. And it's like, we almost build up this who we're supposed to be and forget about who we actually are. And it seems like this spiritual journey was kind of a journey back to who you were and who you truly are as a child. Who I was all along. Right. Mm -hmm. And then just over time, it seems like you just, you know, you, you figured out through society of people around you who you were supposed to be. But in reality, that wasn't the thing that actually made you happy. Yeah, because my whole life was directed towards becoming this, you know, respectable, upwardly mobile person, right? Right, And there wasn't room for what I wanted to do. Like that was just never, like I said earlier, never really part of the conversation yeah. with myself. Yeah, and so when you're doing something like this, I'm sure a lot of people are like, there's probably a lot of pain that you're going through when you're going through this, but you have a real unique perspective on pain in your relationship with it, don't you? Yeah, I mean, pain is a phenomenal teacher. You know, pain doesn't lie. Pain is truth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pain has been the thing that has taught me the most through uh, dark nights of the soul and through my successes. And it, it is a weird thing. Like I remember as a kid in the swimming pool, I was not the most talented swimmer, but I also realized that I was willing to endure more suffering than the other kids. And that's how I was able to bridge a certain talent deficit gap and achieve a certain level of proficiency in that mm -hmm. sport. And from, and that was meaningful to me back then. So I always became, so I just became the grinder. Like I'm not the smartest, I'm not the, but I will outwork you every sure. single time. And that's good in certain doses, but you know, that's also what led to the workaholism right. or that creates a situation in which you're blind to the other areas of your life that require your, your attention. But I think the endurance training helped me kind of calibrate what that relationship should be. And I realized that my ability or my willingness to suffer is a strength mm -hmm. if I could channel it in a healthy way. And ultra endurance is you know, a pretty good template yeah. for somebody who's not afraid to suffer a little bit. For sure. I'm thinking that there's probably people listening and saying, well, you went from alcoholism to workaholism to doing this. And I'm sure there's probably people who said it to you before. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, you just traded to a new addiction. Sure. But for you, what's your, your viewpoint on that? Because I don't, I personally don't see it that way, mm -hmm. but I'm sure you don't. I think well. there's truth in that. You don't? I th yeah. I think it's, I think people who dismiss that mm. are not being honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. 
if you go to any ultra endurance event, there's so many people in recovery at these really? things. Really? Yeah, so many. Lots of tattoos, lots of former junkies, because it is a spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And a lot of drug addicts are people who have that hole in their soul or in mm -hmm. their spirit and they're seekers. Like they they initially seek it out through drugs and alcohol, For Sure. then they get sober, but that hole is still there mm -hmm. yearning to be filled. Um, so I think it's very easy to lapse into an unhealthy relationship with these kinds of pursuits. Mm -hmm. There's a trope uh, called the, you know, the Iron Man widow, like, you know, middle-aged dudes who get into Iron Man and they just want to train all the time and then they're never home and, you know, other areas of their life suddenly aren't getting proper attention right. and their lives kind of fall apart. Right. I've seen that a lot. Um, so I'm somebody who is prone to having, like it, I have buddies, you know, they, they, you know, what they want to do is like go to Vegas with their friends and play golf and gamble or whatever. And when I think about like, oh, wouldn't it be great to like get a cabin in the woods by myself and I can yeah. just train, mm -hmm. you know? Like, yeah. So, you know, I can easily uh, fall into a situation in which it is out of balance for me. So I have to be very mindful about that. And I've been, I've, you know, I've flirted with that in my life before. So basically what I'm saying is I'm, I'm admitting or conceding that, that the addiction piece can, and at times does play a part in my relationship to endurance. Um, but overall, I think it's important to also acknowledge that that's an overly binary, simplistic way of looking at it. For sure. The drink was always the way out, the escape, you know, putting on the running shoes is hard. Yeah, it's um, not. Yeah, it's just, it's just like, <laughs> it's not like when you're, when you're, when you're doing drugs and alcohol, like you just, you don't want to do anything that isn't pleasure oriented. And endurance training is exactly the opposite. It's all about doing what you don't want to do. Yeah. Do you feel like drugs and alcohol is more of like, you don't want to feel, and when you do ultras and, and do this stuff, it's more of you actually feel more. You definitely feel more and there is this deep interconnectedness with yourself that that occurs because it's just it's between you and you For sure. and you're alone whether you're in a race or you're training you know what are you what are you going to do when you're at mile x and you feel like you can't go another step like mm -hmm. that's where you meet your truth and mm -hmm. you can't lie to yourself mm -hmm. about who you are or what you're capable of and i think those difficult moments come early and often in the endurance world. And those are the things that reveal character. Yep. They provide you with these tests to, you know, grapple with who it is exactly that you are. Yep. And, uh, and, and through kind of continuing to show up for that and, and um, eclipsing some of those boundaries, you start to develop a broader sense of possibility and potential for yourself that spills out into every area of your life. Yeah. I've heard David Goggins talk about, you know, the rule of 40%. I've heard that you, you agree with that as well, where it's basically like when you feel like you can't go anymore, you're only about 40% of what mm -hmm. your actual full capacity is. Um, what's your relationship with that? And then also at the same time, what do you feel like you've learned about yourself going past that point that you thought was just absolute, can't go any further from that? Yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had lots of those experiences. Uh, you know, I think that that maxim is rooted in the idea that the body is stronger than the mind and usually it's the mind that 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 kicks out before the body for sure. right because we're not meant we're not as meant you can train all you want but if you're not mentally strong your your achilles heel like the weak weak link in your chain is your mind yeah. right and your mind is going to get you to quit well before the body needs to shut down yeah um, it's yeah, probably had, a safety mechanism probably i'm sure there's an evolutionary you yeah. know advantage to all of that so that you don't you know overly harm yourself for sure do you have uh do you talk to yourself when you're doing this do you have like a, a positive self-talk of of when you're going through this or do you just try to clear everything because i'm real curious as as far as what's going through your head when it is really hard or when you know you still have a hundred miles in front of you or whatever it might be. Yeah, I don't really have a specific practice in that regard. I mean, I would say that that I do my best when I'm as present as possible. And there's something about like that low grade suffering where your heart rate is elevated and you're connecting with your breath that tends to mute out whatever your brain is, you know, whatever, if you were just sitting in a chair without a formal meditation 
practice, your brain's going to start looping some sure. stories and you'll just get lost in thought. But when you're in that active state, there isn't a lot of room for that. Like mm -hmm. you have to be really present with what you're doing. And when you reach those moments where you feel like you can't keep going or like you can't, I don't, I don't think about the destination. I just mm -hmm. try to be present with how I'm feeling and what I'm doing in the moment. But of course your brain's going to go, I can't, I'm so tired. I can't, I'm not even halfway done with this thing. I'm mm -hmm. never going to make it. In those cases, I default to breaking it down into the tiniest chunks possible, which mm -hmm. is, I'm just going to, all I need to do is like get to that lantern, you know, the next street lamp or whatever. And then I'll worry about everything else after I get there. That's the only thing that I'm focused on is how can I get, how can I cross this next hundred meters? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that. I'm trained in that regard because so much of 12 step recovery is similar. Mm -hmm. This precept that you don't have to worry about not doing drugs and alcohol for the rest of your life. You just have to, your head has to hit the pillow tonight sober. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to worry about. Mm -hmm. Like breaking it down into small bite-sized chunks so that the challenge becomes as digestible as possible. Yeah. Rich Devinney talked about that the other day when he was in here. And it's, it's, I think it's, it's funny because there's so many life lessons that are just so simple, you know, and he talks about when he's in these crazy missions and, and it's just like, we just got to get to the next five minutes from now. Mm -hmm. We just got to get to the next tree that's over there, whatever it might be. And I think there's so many lessons in life of just the same way that you're saying it. Don't think about the whole 50 miles that you still have in front of you. It's just like most people get paralysis by analysis thinking of, oh my gosh, I want to build this business. I want to create something amazing, but they don't think about like what's the next 15 minutes and what I need to do to get me closer to there. And then they're paralyzed because what they actually want seems so far away from them. I mean, analysis paralysis is a huge one. I mean, I would have never done Ultraman if I was waiting to figure out the answer to all these questions. For sure. Are, am I going to get in? What kind of bike do I need? What kind of shoes? You mm -hmm. just have to start. Everything that I've ever been successful at, I just started doing it without any of the yep. answers. And I've learned to trust that the journey unfolds in front of you and all those questions get resolved or answered in due time. Mm -hmm. But progress is made through action, not through trying to solve all of this in your mind while you sit at home and do nothing. For sure. And it's the simple you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Just take the first mm -hmm. step and don't worry about mile 478. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious with you, is there, is there anything that you haven't done at this point that you see as like the next mountaintop for you? I know you're talking about being present and all of that, but is there something that, that, that kind of makes you click on the same way that the, the Ultraman did? I don't feel that I have anything that I need to prove to myself or to anybody else mm -hmm. physically. I still love endurance training and I'm sure I'll do a race here and there and maybe I'll really gear up for a race at some point to see what I can do. But that really, you know, isn't my primary motivator. Um, you know, the internal work is never done. Right. So, you know, I've been sober a long time, but I'm still prone to all kinds of character defects and mm -hmm. things that, you know, I could would be would be well advised to better master than I have. Um, and now I'm a parent, I've got four kids, I've got two teenagers, you know, they need my attention and my time. So my focus is how can I be the best dad? Um, and professionally, my, my kind of North star is trying to figure out a way to impact as many people as I possibly can in the most meaningful, substantive and, and, um, effective way possible. So the podcast, the books that I do, the speaking, all of that is oriented around, around that. And when you're an endurance athlete and you want to train 25, 30 hours a week, like mm -hmm. those two things, you know, they compete. Yeah. And, uh, and so as much as it would be cool to set aside everything and train like a madman to see what I could do as a mm -hmm. mid fifties year old guy, how, is that really meaningful to the broader mission of trying to be a force for positive good in the world? So my focus is really on the work that I'm doing now. Yeah. I'm curious with, you know, you going through, how long have you been sober now? Well, I got sober in 96. Mm -hmm. um, I had a little bit of a lapse 13 years ago, a one day lapse. So mm -hmm. I had to recalibrate the clock. Yeah. So I got to be careful. Okay. I mean, I, w I went to treatment in 96. So it's only 24, no, 98, I'm sorry. So nine uh, so that would be coming up on 23 years but really you know coming up on like 14. yeah i'm curious with you with with 
people say, even when they're in recovery, they say, you know, I'm Robin, I'm an alcoholic. I'm curious your thoughts on that, of saying that they're an alcoholic, even when they're in recovery. Do you feel like that makes it easier for someone? Do you feel like it could make it harder because they're still identifying with a, a past version of themselves? Uh, you know, I try not to, I'm not in the business of passing judgment on yeah. how other people think about their own alcoholism. I only mm -hmm. have my own experience. Sure. And that's another thing I've learned in recovery. Like I don't give advice. I yeah. share my experience. Mm -hmm. My experience is that alcoholism is something that, that uh, I have, that's part of who I am that requires a lot of attention in order to keep at bay. And my relapse was a profound teacher in that regard because that was a period of time in which I never questioned whether or not I was an alcoholic, but I thought I had a handle on it. And my meeting attendance had slipped, my kind of um, prioritization of my recovery routine wasn't what it had been before. And I'd really made endurance training my higher power for lack of a better word. Like I had put, I was all in on this, I was going back to Ultraman in 2011 and my goal was to win the race. And I was like so fit and crazy ready, but I really hadn't been paying attention to my recovery. That race ended up not going well. Um, I ended up DNFing, I had all kinds of problems and I was so despondent. And because I hadn't been adequately taking care of myself in that way, I was primed for a relapse. And I can tell you after one sip of a beer, it was like game on. Really? It was like my alcoholism had been doing push-ups in the dark all along and was like ready to go. Really? And it was scary, really scary. Wow. So that immediately disabused me of any idea that I could one day drink like a gentleman. Mm -hmm. It was very clear mm -hmm. that it went immediately without any thought on my part. Like it was so spontaneous and strange how it happened, but very clear that that's something I can never do again. Um, and ultimately has been a seemingly negative experience that ended up turbocharging my recovery program because it was so clear that like, this is something that, you know, for me, I'm always going to live with mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that because the process of getting sober and the principles and the tools that I've learned and the number of people that I now get to help um, has given my life like, you know, incredible meaning. Mm -hmm. um, as far as being a vegan, uh, I'm, I'm, I know you, you guys, you and your wife have cookbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, my girlfriend and I purchased it like six years ago. Oh, That's cool. how we started going vegan on everything. And uh, I'm curious with you, uh, with being a vegan, what are some of the, be I mean, you talked about the benefits as far as energy, um, and it didn't seem like it was a, you know, pro animal thing for mm -hmm. you, but over the time that you've been doing it for, for how many years is this that you've been, been vegan? Like almost 14 years, I 14 think. years. Yeah. Um, what have you noticed? And obviously you don't seem like the type of person wants to recommend or tell people what to do mm -hmm. in any sort of way, but for people who are out there that are thinking about it in some sort of way, like they've, maybe they are on a journey where they've looked at themselves in the mirror and be like, maybe I should go vegan. Mm -hmm. What's the simplest way to do something like that? I think there's a lot of on-ramps uh, to this lifestyle that has been such a positive in my life. So it really depends upon what people are sensitive to or interested in. For me, like I said, it was kind of vanity mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. just wanting to feel good. It was a very selfish concern. But after doing this for so long and being very steeped in the plant-based movement, um, I've become much more passionate about the environmental implications of the mm -hmm. food that we eat, um, the health considerations uh, of the food that we eat and the suffering that is incident to a system of conglomerized animal agriculture that is disgusting by any measure. Mm -hmm. Even the ardent meat eater can't you know, get on board with the practices of factory farming at the highest level. And I think on the, in addition to that, you know, the United States being this unbelievably prosperous country our, our health outcomes are not so good. Mm. And millions and millions of people are suffering from an accelerating uh, rate of chronic disabilities that are entirely lifestyle related, mm. whether it's obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, um, 
heart disease, of course, all of these things are directly correlated to the foods that we eat. Mm -hmm. And Americans have a taste for highly processed food, food that's very high in saturated fat and artificial ingredients and the like, and it's making us very unwell. And so the way that I look at the plant-based lifestyle is like this means of checking all kinds of boxes. You're being healthier for yourself. The animals are happier. Mm -hmm. They're certainly you know, happy yeah. that you're not consuming them. And it's better for the environment. I mean, right now, we're in the midst of a mass species extinction. We are raping and pillaging the rainforest to clear them to raise crops for, for animal feed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the deleterious environmental impact of, I mean, I just listed like one thing out of a million things that get packed into animal agriculture, the extent to which it's um, polluting our waterways and creating these algal blooms. And it's just, it's just, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable. So like I said, it's not incumbent upon me to tell anybody how they should live, mm -hmm. but I don't miss eating the way that I did before. I feel great. 54, I still can go out and kill it. Mm -hmm. You know, I rode 40 miles today. I feel good. Um, and it's nice to opt out of participating in a system that's really just creating harm. Yeah, for sure. And I it's, don't stand on any pedestal with this either. Like I'm not better than anyone else because I'm eating a vegan diet. It's not a harm-free lifestyle. It's just an aspiration to live a little bit more gentle on mm -hmm. the planet. Yeah, and, and going back to that book that you were talking, Engine 2, where, so mm -hmm. my brother-in-law is, I remember when I decided I wanted to start eating vegan, I got, everybody made fun of me, right? Because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you, you, okay. And uh, and it's not as bad as people act like it is. Like no. you, there's some really delicious stuff that you can have. Like it's not like you just eat lettuce all day long. Yeah. But uh, but my brother-in-law is a firefighter. So he's, oh, wow. he, he loves- In Austin? No, he's a firefighter in Tampa. Mm. So he- um, but people don't realize going back to, to firefighters is they go, th their bodies go through a lot. Like heart attacks are very common as mm -hmm. for them at young ages. Uh, strokes are very common at young ages for them. So my brother-in-law um, had a second heart attack and he's not like severely overweight in any sort of wow. way. He had a second heart attack and they decided to, you know, give it a shot because uh, his cholesterol is really high. His cholesterol dropped like 20 points in two weeks. Mm. And just it's like- crazy how fast it happens. How, the, yeah. It's amazing how- how quick the body can change. Like it's, it is made to shift the way that it needs to. And once you start feeling really good, you realize for how long you actually felt really bad mm -hmm. and you realize you didn't have energy for a long time. And you're like, Oh my God, this is like, right. you're saying, you're like, Oh my God, I do have this surplus of energy in ways, mm -hmm. you yeah, know? Yeah. 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 The body is unbelievably resilient. And I learned that with food as well as with the endurance stuff. It's like, you think it's only capable of doing X until you eclipse that boundary. And then you realize that there's so much more potential baked into all of us if sure. we can just you know, embrace the possibilities a little bit more broadly. For sure. Well, Rich, I appreciate it. It's been Thank great. Thank you, man. Good um, to talk to you. Where can people find you? What's um, going on in your easy future? Easy to find, Rich Roll Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, richroll.com is kind of where all my stuff is, uh, at Rich Roll on the socials. Um, got a bunch of books on my website that you can check out, but the podcast is the main thing. Rich, appreciate it, man. Thank you, man. Good talking to you. Yeah, you too. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you love this video, I've got another one you're going to love. Just click right here and watch it.